Well, it's good to be here with you guys. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. If you don't know me, you can go ahead and open to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 7. That's where we're going to be tonight as we continue working through uh, our look at the book of Luke this calendar year. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take one of the Bibles and the chairs in front of you. Make that your own. If you're uh, watching from Parker today, we'd love if you just stood up. There's a table in the back with some uh, Bibles there. You can grab one of those and follow along. And as well, you can make that your own. Uh, and, and we want you to have a Bible because we believe that if you read and apply the Word of God, it will change your life. And one of the things, kind of the, the weird little uh, trends that we get to watch is just how many Bibles we buy to replenish the ones that are taken. And we've just seen a massive uptick on the, the number of orders that we've had to put in, which means you guys are reading the Bible, potentially grabbing them, giving them to friends who are in need of it. And we love that. We will always be excited to buy more Bibles to replenish the ones that you guys are taking. Uh, but we're going to be in Luke chapter 7, and as I was thinking about this, I, I found myself in a season the last couple weeks, me and my family, a season of events and parties that we had been invited to. Most of them are graduation parties. As uh, you know, a former youth pastor, I'm always getting invited to graduation and graduation parties. I think we've been to five. One of them uh, was right before this service. We'll go right after this service to another one, and I think that's it for the season, but there's also been, you know, my son's kindergarten graduation event and birthday parties and other events. And there's so many events in this past season. And it got me thinking, when you say yes to an invitation event, there's, there's a risk there for you. There's a risk that your expectation of what will happen doesn't exactly pan out. There's a risk that that event gets weird or awkward. Now, all the events I've gone to in the last couple of weeks have been wonderful, great hosts, amazing events, like don't, don't read into that. But that all, hasn't always been the case. And it probably is the same for you. You've probably said yes to an event and showed up and were drastically surprised by the difference of expectation of reality. How many of you have been in that place? You said yes, you came to an event, a party, a birthday event, something, where, where you're like, this is not what I was expecting. Maybe, maybe you dressed Havasu casual and it was not Havasu casual. Maybe, maybe you're like, hey, this is going to be an hour tops, and you get there, and it's like a four-hour event, and you can't leave without being rude, and you're like, why did I come? Or maybe it, it, this, is, this has not yet happened to us, but I've heard stories. You get invited, so you and your, your child get invited to another child's birthday party, and you show up, and it's just you as the attendee on the other side. I've not yet had that happen. Anyone here have that where they're the only guests? Okay, just a couple. I've heard horror stories of that. They just show up and it's like, it's just me. What do I say? What do I do? I didn't bring a present. This is awkward. See, sometimes when we say yes to an event invitation, the things don't pan out the way we're expecting. And today as we look at, at Luke chapter 7, we see Jesus say yes to an event invitation. And this happened frequently for Jesus. Jesus was frequently going to people's homes and going to events and parties, being the guest of honor at these things. But sometimes the event didn't pan out the way it was planned. And that's what we're going to see here in Luke chapter 7. And uh, I, I think this is a really cool thing as we unpack uh, what took place here and what that means for us. So Luke 7, we're going to start down in verse 36. And it says this. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet... He would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, right off the bat, we see that this is a very odd instance. This is probably something that has never happened at one of your birthday parties or dinner events or gatherings. This is, this is kind of unique here. But, but what I want to do is I want to walk through just a couple, look at this from a couple different angles of like what's going on in this story and what can this teach us. So the first thing I want to look at is the place. Where do we find ourselves in this story? What, what's the setting? The setting is the Pharisee's house. The, a Pharisee hears that Jesus is coming through his area, invites Jesus to, to come and be there with them. 
And so he's the host. He's preparing for this. He's getting ready. He's probably moving furniture around because Jesus didn't travel places alone. He's getting everything ready. He's, he's probably cleaning and tidying up, whatever that looked like. I don't know if you sweep a dirt floor or just kind of smooth it out. I don't know. But, but he's getting ready. And Jesus finds himself on the home turf of a Pharisee. And, and that frequently happened. We don't know the Pharisee's motivation, but we know that Jesus finds himself in, on, on his ground, on the Pharisee's ground. And a lot of times when this happened, Jesus had to go on the defensive. He had to defend his teaching or his reputation. He had to answer very pointed questions and very uh, hostile conversations. And so Jesus is walking into the home of a Pharisee wondering, okay, what exactly is going to happen this time? What's their motivation? What's their direction? And so that's where we find ourselves with the place. But I think really the bigger thing to unpack is actually the people. So the second thing we look at is the people. And we, right off the bat, as we've already seen, we, we're introduced to the Pharisee. And, and, and he's the host. He's kind of the, the person coordinating all this. And we'll later learn that his name is Simon. And uh, that's not to be confused with Simon Peter, who is one of Jesus' disciples. This is a Pharisee named Simon. Apparently, Simon was a common name in that day. I don't know anything about common names because Robert Smith, my name, is not a very common name in our culture at all. So, you know, it, apparently that's weird to have the same name as someone else. But, but the Pharisee's name is Simon. And, and, you know, if you're a host... You're putting some effort in. You're thinking through the, the, the evening. You're planning. You're coordinating. You're saying, okay, here's what I want to see happen. And, 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 and there's some, some control involved in that. If you're a host, sometimes you enjoy that. You're like, I want to host this dinner party because it means I don't have to eat food I don't like. Or I don't have to worry about going to someone's house who has like 15 cats and they're going to be crawling all over me all night and I'm going to be sneezing while I'm trying to eat this food I don't like. And you're like, I'm just going to host it at my house. So the Pharisee is coming in with an element of control. Hey, I, I get to determine kind of what happens, what takes place, and, and, and what the flow of the evening will be, but that's not exactly what happens for him. Because he finds himself being completely derailed by the woman's action who shows up. We'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But also I think that, that part of his reaction, we see his reaction there is, is frustration, is anger with this woman who comes in. I think part of that is because his control, his planning was sidetracked. But I think maybe another big reason is because she was now the center of attention. See, maybe he was thinking that through the evening he would be the one that everyone was looking to besides Jesus, that Jesus was going to give him all the attention and focus. Because after all, he's the one who planned the dinner party. He prepared for this. He invited Jesus. So he's the one sh that should get all the accolades, all the attention, all the focus. Or so he thinks. How many of us have been in that place where we're like, I did all the work. I put in all the effort. I should get the credit. I should get the, the attention. I should get the accolades. And I think that's an element of why he's frustrated is because he did everything and yet doesn't get the attention, the praise, the accolades maybe he was looking for. But really, I think the thing that we need to look at, maybe the biggest issue that he found in this was that he was approaching this whole situation with a judgmental mindset towards this woman. You know, we're, we're told here what he thought in the moment. He thought, hey, if this man was actually a prophet, he would know what type of woman this was. And there's a, there's a condescending implication behind that. This man's thought life is one that kind of assumed that this woman, because of whatever her life issues were, whatever her mistakes were, that she didn't deserve Jesus' attention and focus. That she didn't deserve to be at that party. And you kind of have the thought that if it were up to the Pharisee, they probably would have just escorted the woman out on the street and kicked her out of the party. But thankfully, Jesus was the one calling the shots, not the man. But if we're honest, how often do we find ourselves in that same place? Of like the Pharisee judging other people based on their external attributes. We look around at other people, we judge them based on on what they look like. We judge them based on their parenting or their work ethic. We, base, we, we judge them based on their, their financial decisions, based on their appearance, their motivation. And maybe we judge them a little bit so we can feel better about ourselves. 
If we say, hey, look at how bad they are, I can feel a little better about how I'm doing in life. And I wonder if that's a little bit of what's going on with the Pharisee. If he points out the mess that that she's in and, and, and judges her, he can feel better about his own life and where he's at with things. So we have the Pharisee who starts out supposedly as the main character of the story, but he ends up being kind of a secondary character. But then we have the woman. The woman's the, the second person of the story, and, and I, I wish there was more backstory, more detail of how she found herself at that party. Our world, all we know is that she heard Jesus was going to be there, and she goes and shows up, which shows us that sometimes inviting yourself to a party can actually turn out pretty good. Like, sometimes just like crashing an event works out well. Um, and apparently she didn't know that you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to just show up, which I'm always cracked up. My kids are always like, can we just go to so-and-so's house? I'm like, we don't even know them. I don't know where they live. And they're like, so can we go? And I'm like, no, we can't. They didn't get that. You can't just show up to someone's house, but that's what this woman did. She just showed up. She heard Jesus was going to be there, and she thought, I need to be where Jesus is. And so she went. So we have an unnamed woman at an event at a Pharisee's house with Jesus. And we don't know much about her other than she lived in this area and that she carries the the title of a sinner. And so likely the community had assigned this this label and title to her and, and she carried a stigma around wherever she went. We don't know exactly what that is. Tradition will say that there's, you know, a sexual promiscuity connotation to her sin. And there, but we aren't told exactly what that is, and I don't think it matters. What matters is, though, that, that prior to Jesus, sin is what defined her life. Prior to Jesus, whatever her issue was, that is what defined her And, and we don't know if it was sex, if it was money, if it was pride, anger, jealousy, Whatever it was in her life, she carried that external label. But now she found herself in a situation with Jesus and and coming before him to worship him, setting aside the stigmas, the labels, the, the, the judgment, and saying, I need to be at the feet of Jesus, literally at the feet of Jesus. And we see her fully repentant, fully broken over her sin, but fully devoted to worshiping Jesus as well. And so maybe you find yourself in in her place a little bit too. Maybe you look at your life and you're like, man, I've carried some labels, some stigmas. I've I've carried the, the result of my own failures and bad decisions and people have labeled me accordingly. And if that's you, look at this woman and realize there's nothing that you can do that will keep you from falling at the feet of Jesus and receiving forgiveness. Because that's exactly what this woman experienced. She experienced forgiveness and grace from God, and I wanna show you exactly how that happened. Let's keep reading in the story, picking up in verse 40. And to catch us up, the Pharisee had just made that, that comment in his head. Verse 40, and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. And Jesus said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owned 50. When they both could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Now, Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he has canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
See, Jesus takes the, the events and the moment that was going on here and uses it as a teaching moment to show us the point. See, maybe you're a little like me and you see instances like this, stories, events that take place in Scripture, and you go, okay, what's the point of all of this? And sometimes, like here, Jesus stops and says, let me show you exactly what the point of all this is. And he, he tells this parable about the debt forgiveness of one person who owed 500 denarii, another who owed 50, to contrast the woman and the Pharisee against one another. And the woman with that title of sinner, that title maybe of failure or screw up, whatever people called her in that day, Jesus is equating her with that person who was forgiven the 500 denarii. And the Pharisee, the person who's self-righteous, who thinks, ah, I'm pretty good, he's equated to the person who was forgiven of the 50. And Jesus tells the story to show the power that forgiveness has in our life. And when we realize how much we've been forgiven, it changes how we view the world around us. It changes how we view our Savior when we realize the, the gravity, the, the, the depth of the sins that we've been forgiven for. See, the woman, she knew, she was broken, she was repentant, she was remorseful, and you see the change that is created in her life. She changed her plans and priorities so she could be there with Jesus. She changed uh, in, in how she acted. She was generous in giving of herself. She changed in how she worshiped. She was, was extravagant in her actions towards Jesus. Even if people thought this was ridiculous or undignified or embarrassing, she didn't care because the, the forgiveness of Jesus had changed her life. She loved much because she had been forgiven much. But you look at the Pharisee and his actions in that same moment, his plans didn't change all that much. It was just a slight modification. Instead of eating dinner by myself, we'll eat dinner with Jesus. He's not all that generous in terms of what he offers. He doesn't serve or do much for Jesus specifically. And Jesus calls it out. Hey, you didn't, wa you didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. You didn't greet me lovingly. There's no external acts of worship that this man has in this moment with Jesus. See, Jesus is pointing out here that, that as we look at how we've been forgiven, it changes us. So let me ask you, who do you identify more in this story? Do you identify with the, the woman who, who has an immense past, maybe a lot of brokenness for past decisions and, and failures? Do you, do you carry some titles, some stigmas that people have assigned to you in the past? If so, hear the words of Jesus, your faith has saved you. Sin is, is forgiven through Jesus. And if you're in a place where, where you're like, man, I don't know, I don't know if anyone could love me or accept me or, or consider me worthy. Know that Jesus does. And if you want to start or restart a relationship with Jesus, doing so brings forgiveness and grace into your life. And if you've never done that, it's as easy as just having a conversation with God. Us churchy people, we call that prayer, but it's just going to God and, and first just admitting, hey, I'm a failure. Here's, here's where I failed you. Here's where I've fallen short of your expectations. But next, it's confessing that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world. Saying, God, I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sins and rose three days later. And thirdly, it says that our final act is to tell other people, hey, I believe in Jesus and want to follow him. Maybe that's just calling one other person that, that you know goes to church and believes in God, or maybe that's you stepping into the waters of baptism to tell the whole church, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus has changed my life. So maybe you identify with the woman, or maybe you identify with the Pharisee. Maybe you're like, hey, my, my life isn't defined by, by massive failures and, and, and titles of, of sin and mistakes. And maybe that changes how you view forgiveness to some way. That's me. I, my past is not one that is full of failures. I, I don't have a story of going to jail or being freed from addiction to drugs before Jesus. I'm a little like the Pharisee who 
my temptation is to think that I can do life on my own, that I just need a little sprinkling of Jesus here and there. But in that, my need is to be ever aware of my own sin. Because as I am aware of my own sin, I'm aware of God's forgiveness in my life. And, and see, I think that some of us have a shallow understanding of God's grace and his forgiveness because we have a shallow understanding of our own sin and brokenness. And we may not carry an external title or label of sin like this woman did, but we've all got sin on the inside. We might be judgmental like the Pharisee. We may be jealous of what other people have. We may harbor unforgiveness or bitterness or rage. And instead of looking at other people saying, hey, are, are they better or worse than me? We need to look at scripture and say, hey, hey God, how am I doing? And realize that, that we don't measure up but in every place we don't measure up, Jesus does for us. And as we're aware of our own sin, here's what that does. The first thing it does is it gives us a chance to grow, to repent and grow past that, that sin, that failure to be more like Jesus. But secondly, it gives us a chance to grow in our knowledge of God's love for us. As we are aware of our own sin, we grow in how much we understand God's forgiveness. That's what Jesus is saying here. If we're forgiven much, we love much. So the point of this first is to understand, hey, Jesus loves you immensely. And at every place of failure you have, his grace shows up. That's the first point of this. But the second point is for us to realize that we're to live with the forgiveness of Jesus. And that's where it gets a little bit more challenging for us. Because Jesus, as he turns and looks at the woman and says, your sins are forgiven, everyone at the party, there's this like collective gasp that we can read through the lines. Like everyone's like, <gasps> he said what? And especially to the Pharisee who's like, wait, she's forgiven? Do you even know what she's done? The, and Jesus is, is saying this to the Pharisee, I think to really challenge how he views people but to challenge how we view people as well. And, and the point is for us to live with that same level of grace and forgiveness, which is why I love here at Calvary, one of our values is uncomfortable grace. We believe that followers of Jesus should demonstrate the same unending grace and forgiveness that Jesus offers us. And I love the title of that too, and I know we've talked about that, but sometimes forgiveness is easy. We can forgive the person who cuts us off in traffic, or we can forgive the person who takes the parking spot when we're like, I had my blinker on, that was obviously my parking spot. But sometimes the friend who sabotages us, the, 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 the business partner who double crosses us, the family member who can continually belittles us to the other family, sometimes those points of forgiveness are a little bit more uncomfortable. Sometimes those ones are a little bit more challenging. But followers of Jesus are to live with the same forgiveness that Jesus has offered us. And so how are you doing with that? How are you doing it at living with the forgiveness of Jesus in your life? See, I think this is something that, that we're always having to work on and always having to say, hey, who do I need to be forgiving? What grudge do I need to let go of? What thing do I need to move past? What people do I need to make a phone call to or send a text message to and just offer forgiveness? Because Jesus says, hey, I'm going to forgive you, which means I'm expecting you to forgive others as well. And as we do that, I think we get to the last point, and that is the peace. See, as you look at the closing verse, it's easy to skim over this, but Jesus says to the woman, verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Peace. It's probably something that this woman didn't have a lot of. She probably didn't have a lot of peace before this. Certainly walking into this dinner party, there was a lot of anxiety and self-doubt and worry and stress. What will people say? What will they do? Will they kick me out? Will I even be able to talk to Jesus? And she's met with peace. 
encountering Jesus and, and receiving forgiveness from him changes her life and she leaves with peace. And we are in such a desperate need for peace in our world today. And not just peace overseas in terms of a ceasefire in Ukraine or in other countries. I'm talking peace in our, in our life, in our soul, in our spirit. Because there's so much stress, there's so much anxiety, there's so much worry and depression and, and tension that exists in our world. And if you look at where we're at in history, it makes sense. We've got these devices that tell us every bad thing that happens everywhere in the world in real time. We've got these, these devices that show us a highlight reel of other people's lives that's curated and, and made to look perfect and makes us feel like we don't measure up. We've got a world that's full of economic or political tension and difficulty, and we need peace. And we're reminded here that we can find peace in Jesus. And, and falling at the feet of the Savior of the world and saying, Jesus, I worship you, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to give my life over to you, we can exchange all that stress, all that anxiety, all that worry for the peace of the God of the universe. A woman experienced peace, and I believe that when we bring whatever stress, whatever anxiety, if that's our past, our present, our future, and bring it to Jesus, we can exchange that for peace. And I also feel like when we grant forgiveness to those around us, we find peace in that as well. I think that's the second way that, that we're challenged here on that point of peace because we don't often realize that the bitterness, the, the poison that exists is unforgiveness in our heart. When we're harboring that, that unforgiveness towards others, the way that that sabotages our peace. And Jesus just says, you are forgiven, go in peace. So today, it's our hope, our prayer for you that you're living changed by the forgiveness and grace of God. That, that looking at the cross of Jesus and what he's done for you changes your life, both inwardly as you understand the God of the universe and how he's not mad at you, how he's not holding grudges over your head, but how he loves you and wants to forgive you. But I hope it changes you externally as well with how you treat other people, how you give grace to those who hurt you, how you forgive those who have sinned against you. And I pray that, that that would change your life, that it would start a ripple effect of changing everyone that you encounter. And I long for the day that our communities are changed because of the forgiveness of the people who call themselves followers of Jesus. Because this woman showed us here that forgiveness is the thing that changes people's lives. It was that way in her day, and it's exactly the same way today. So I pray that you receive, but also give the forgiveness of Jesus to those around you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the fact that we are forgiven. As people who have sinned much, God, I thank you that we have been forgiven much. And God, I pray that wherever we fall on the spectrum, if we are, are, are over aware of our sin and failures, that you would remind us of grace. God, if we think that we are self-righteous like the Pharisee, remind us of our sin. Remind us of, of how we fall short so that we can be aware of your grace and we can grow to be forgiven much so that we can love you much. And God, it is in our nature to, to, to hold bitterness and unforgiveness towards others, so help us to the, be the people who live counterculturally, who forgive and offer grace readily to those who hurt us so that we can live with peace, but also give peace to those we encounter as well. I thank you, God, that you have come into our world to change us, to save us, and I pray that we would be different because of that. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.